let's try that again. Hi, my name is Russ Belville. I am the executive director of 420radio.org. We are a 24-hour marijuana legalization radio network. You can catch us on the internet, 420radio.org. Or, if you've got a smartphone, you can get us on the TuneIn app. You know, tune in radio. You just search for 420 radio. My show, the Russ Belville Show, is on weekdays, 3 p.m. Pacific. We do two hours a day. First hour is traditional talk radio where we do the news headlines, some analysis, some interviews. A lot of the people that are on the panels here, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews with them. And then in the second hour, it's talk radio. People can call in and tell their stories of being patients or getting busted or what happened with their grow or why they want to grow industrial hemp. We cover it from hemp to consumer cannabis to medical marijuana to just the whole idea of freedom. And so today, I wanted to do a talk called The Results of Legalization, the data from six months of retail marijuana legalization in Colorado, because for so long our opponents predicted that the sky would fall if we legalized marijuana. Oh, terrible things will happen. As if legalization invents marijuana somehow. But now we have actual data. We have real facts that we can point to from six months of retail legalization in the state of Colorado. And for those of you who are wonky like me and you like your data and like to look it up for yourself, don't trust me, look it up for yourself. This PowerPoint presentation will be available at 420radio.org and there's little hyperlinks, you'll see them down at the bottom, you know. You'll see all these little blue hyperlinks, you can click right to those and get the data for yourself. Find the actual news stories that all this is based on. Unlike the prohibitionists who rarely tell you where their data comes from. So there were three main predictions that were made terrible things that would happen if we were to legalize marijuana. And the first one was the traffic risk. Something I like to call smoth. Stoned mayhem on the freeways. Oh no. If we legalize marijuana, people will smoke pot and drive. Because legalizing invents cars and marijuana, I guess. But that's one of their big fears. In fact, one of the quotes from one of their leaders is that there's a twice as likely chance that someone who's a marijuana driver gets into a fatal crash. We're going to take a look at that statistic and some more when we talk about this stone mayhem on the freeways. Another talking point they have is the social costs. We can't legalize marijuana because kids will get addicted to it and there'll be, you know, people calling in sick to work and injuries when they back the forklift over someone. We can't do it for that reason. In fact, one of their leaders like to say, for every dollar that we spend in marijuana or in alcohol and tobacco, that we collect in alcohol and tobacco taxes, we spend 10 times as much in the social costs from alcohol and tobacco. So we'll take a look at that and kind of show you why that doesn't really co correlate to what's going on with marijuana. And then the third talking point is the talking point about marijuana being this deadly gateway drug. There will be addiction. And what about the children? Something I call Watsy. What about the children? What, what will happen if we legalize marijuana? In fact, one of their talking points is that one out of six kids that tries marijuana becomes addicted to it. I'm going to poke a real big hole into that statistic as well. Plus, we got some video in here direct from them so you can hear it from their mouths and some fun stuff as well. So thank you for being here. Let's get started. This is one of the leaders. He's a fellow by the name of Kevin Sabet. Everybody see this guy on TV before? A few people? If you hear a talking point coming out of a sheriff or a rehab guy on your local TV news, he wrote it. He's the guy, he's the quarterback, he's the architect of all their drug war talking points. Your kinder, gentler drug wars. And so this is one of the ones he likes to say a whole lot. Look, let's go back there. And we can talk. The British Medical Journal told us a few months ago that their most comprehensive study they've ever done showed that marijuana intoxication doubles your car crash risk. Marijuana intoxication doubles your car crash risk. Well, first of all, the way that they get a stat like that is they, took, like, they take a look at all of the people who crashed and died, and then they take a look at what's in their blood or urine. Sure, some people may have had marijuana in their system. That doesn't mean that's what caused their wreck. You know, we also see a whole lot more of these days. Fatal wrecks involving gay married people. Because now there are gay married people, right? Because now that exists. When we legalize marijuana, sure, there's going to be more marijuana turning up in your statistics. That doesn't mean that it caused the wreck. 
So we can't really get away with that. And one of the ways I like to point a hole in that is by going to a study that came after the British Medical Journal study. That came out in 2012. This is one from 2013 by Dr. Guo Ali. They found, yeah, compared to a sober driver, you know, that's the one-to-one, -one, right, sober driver, a marijuana driver's got a 1.83 to one greater risk. But compared to someone on narcotics like Oxy, Vicodin, and Percocet, they've got a three to one. Stimulants like Adderall, Ritalin, and Phentermine are almost are three and a half to one, or more than three and a half to one. And depressants like Valium, Clonopin, and Adamant, almost five to one risk. So I'm not saying marijuana is not a risk, but nobody's talking about coming up with nanogram limits for any of those other drugs. They seem to be much more dangerous, aren't they? And then of course there's the big one, alcohol. 13.64 to one risk if you drink alcohol. And that's not over 0.08, that's any alcohol. Your risk is up by 13 times. And if you've used alcohol plus any of these drugs in this list, 23 and a quarter to one risk. So it's not that marijuana is not a risk, it's just probably the weakest kid in the block to pick on. All the rest of these are a worse risk that we need to worry about. Now, one of the things that I like about marijuana legalization, it gives us a chance to shape the way our society treats marijuana. See, before marijuana was legalized, we didn't get any messages about what responsible use is. You don't hear many people talking about, we need to have less drinking in America. They may say we need to drink less, but they don't say we should have fewer drinkers. They should drink responsibly. They shouldn't drink and drive. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. Hand someone the keys. Buzz driving is drunk driving, but not stop drinking. So what's nice about marijuana legalization is now we can have our own commercials. We can have our own taglines that tell people, hey, it's not cool to get really high and drive. And so the Colorado Department of Transportation got a grant from the federal government. It was a $400,000 grant. And these are some of the ads that they put on to convince people to not drive high. <laughs> Installing a is now legal. Driving to get a new one is not. Drive high, get a DUI. <laughs> so it seems to me like even the government doesn't think it's that big a deal, right? You don't get these funny, jokey commercials about drunk driving, right? You get some serious, deadly, ooh, scary music commercials. So we're making progress. Here's a graph I like to show that kind of gives you an example of what the hell are we worried about? This whole scare of stoned driving is a problem and a solution in search of a problem. This blue line represents the deaths per 100 million miles in the United States. It's been going steadily down. Roads have been getting safer. Cars have been getting safer. The dotted lines, the dark one's Colorado, and the light green one there is Washington State. Since 2005, when they've started really ramping up the marijuana, they've been safer than the United States. So what's the problem? They legalized weed and they got safer. And this red dotted line, just for comparison's sake, is Georgia, a place that really hates weed, and it's kind of above the national average. Now, correlation is not causation, but where are all these stone drivers we're supposed to be so scared of? And now another message from the Colorado Department of Transportation. Morning. 
They pulled over over 1,500 vehicles that made 22 arrests. 20 of those were alcohol DUIs, one was a minor in possession, one was a minor in possession of marijuana. Zero was the number of marijuana DUIs. They legalized weed, they pulled over 1,500 cars on a nice May weekend night. Zero marijuana DUIs. And the number of DUIs filed in the, de in the county courts in Colorado since 2009 have dropped from just under 32,000 to just under 25,000 for the past two years since Colorado has legalized marijuana. So where are all these stone drivers they're so worried about? They're not showing up in the traffic statistics. And now a final message from the Colorado Department of Transportation. Grilling high is now legal. Driving to get the propane you forgot isn't. <laughs> Drive high, get a UI. She wins at the end there. I think she's the best. Now, when it comes to this whole scare about stoned driving, I looked to two countries and their authorities on this. First, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. The United States government agency in charge of keeping us safe on the road said there is little, if any, evidence to indicate that drivers who have used marijuana alone are any more likely to cause serious accidents than drug-free drivers. Wow. And then a guy named Franjo Grobner, who's a, a scientist who does research on impairment and driving, he researched this for the United Kingdom, and he said, quote, the risk of all drug-positive drivers compared to drug-free drivers is similar to drivers with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.05. The risk is also similar to drivers above age 60 compared to younger drivers around age 35. So he's saying a stoned driver is no worse than a 0.05 alcohol and no worse than an over 60 driver. And yet we're supposed to be so scared of the stoned drivers. Final thing on stone drivers, Washington State also legalized, and one of their news stations, KIRO in Seattle, decided to take a look at marijuana-using drivers and decide whether or not this five nanogram per milliliter limit that has been established in Washington State made any sense. They collected one person who was a, you know, used once a year, very rarely used pot. Another guy who was a weekend toker, who, you know, every weekend or so he'd smoke some weed. And both of them did fine driving over five nanograms. The, both the cop watching and the driving instructor in the car said they were driving fine. But for today, I decided just to focus on a young lady I like to call All Day Addie. All Day Addie is a medical marijuana patient in Washington State who smokes, as she says, all day. She showed up to the test at three times the legal limit. She showed up, she was already at 16 nanograms. Check out what the news editor should say about it all day, Addy here. Our first volunteer, Addy, is a 27-year-old medical marijuana patient and heavy daily user who had smoked some pot prior to arriving. A blood test before our experiment began showed she came to the track already three times the new legal limit for driving under the influence of marijuana. The limit is five nanograms. She was at nearly 16 nanograms. Mm -hmm. While learning the course, Addie turned too sharp at the stop sign and clipped one of our cameras. But the instructor told us her driving was actually fine. Her driving was actually fine. Three times the legal limit of alcohol would be a 0.24 blood alcohol. Think someone would be driving fine at 0.24? But they gave her more weed. This is how the experiment went on. They gave them another 0.3 grams every 20 minutes. Like a full bowl. Smoke full bowl. Now we'll take you out on the course again. So check how that turned out. Back behind the wheel for another lap, Addie drove a bit slower than she should and at one point struck a traffic cone. Oh, I have a cone. I see it in the rear mirror. Ah! A blood test would later show Addie was driving at seven times the legal limit for pot with 36.7 nanograms of marijuana in her system. But still, 
driving okay. I'm going to go off the road now. Well, oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to go off the road. Seven times will be the limit. Uh, I'll call that be a point five six. You'd be lucky if you could find the ignition to turn the damn thing on at point five six. But guess what, folks? They gave her more weed. More weed for Addie. After three bowls, up to 0.9 grams. After nine tenths of a gram, Addie was becoming much more aggressive, excited about being high and behind the wheel. <laughs> you get to do this, you should do it. <laughs> 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 he asked the officer if he would pull her over. Uh, borderline. That's the cop. So yeah, when they start talking about these stolen drivers and the need for these five nanogram limits, it's all junk science, as I hope that showed. But let's get to some of the other talking points. Two other talking points that we've got. And the next one was it just wouldn't be worth it, because one of the big selling points we've got on legalization is, hey, we're going to tax regulate it, right? We're going to get all this tax money for schools. We're going to get tax money, tax money. And they want to poke a hole in that. And so one of the ways they do is by saying it wouldn't be worth it. There'd be so much damage from legalization, it just wouldn't be worth it. Here's how Kevin Sabet puts it. For every dollar we get on alcohol and tobacco tax in this country, we spend $10 in lost social costs. So people that look at this know this is actually a loss leader. For every dollar we get in taxes in alcohol and tobacco, it costs us $10 in social costs. This is actually true. We take in $40 billion a year in alcohol and tobacco taxes. We spend $400 billion a year in liver cirrhosis and drunk driving and lung cancer and you know all the things that come with alcohol and tobacco. What's this got to do with marijuana? Marijuana is neither toxic nor addictive. So why would we compare it? Because he needs to kind of fool you. He needs to distract you with this idea that legalized marijuana would somehow, again, make things terrifying. As if legalization invents marijuana, and it does not. So let me show you how we poke a few holes in this. Here's Colorado's tax revenues just for the first four months of legalization, and that's actually 2014, not 2013. My bad on the slide. Should be this year, 2014. They pulled in $10.8 million in recreational taxes. They pulled in $9.6 million in the medical marijuana taxes. That's just sales taxes on medical marijuana. Uh, recreational has excise taxes and another extreme sales tax to go with it. Licensing fees of both medical and recreational, 6.6 .6 million. That brings us a total of $27.2 million in four months that the state of Colorado have brought in on what turns out to be $202 million in gross sales in four months. That's $50 million a weed a month. Wow. And where's that money going? Well. Schools are going to get 40 million. Youth drug prevention is going to get 45 and a half. Drug treatment is going to get 40.4. Public health is going to get 12.4. And even the cops, law enforcement, get 3.2 million dollars of it. Because yeah, there are some new laws to enforce. So all right, whatever. So if Kevin Subet likes to say, for every dollar we spend, it costs 10 dollars in social costs, and they brought in 27.2 million dollars. Where's the $272 million in social costs? Where, where, where has Colorado gone to hell? Have we seen riots and flames and schools crumbling? No. I've been to Colorado numerous times. It's very nice. It's much nicer now. As we've shown you, DUIs and fatalities, virtually unchanged, actually kind of going down a bit. So there's no social cost there. The crime rate in Denver is down 10%. Travel to Denver is up 6.2%. Home values in Denver are up 9.7%. And 9,641 jobs exist in the marijuana industry now. So there's no cost there. Now, what about the children? No, what about the children? Kids might smoke pot. Well, 230 of them got caught, as a matter of fact, in the school year of 2013. 230 kids did get caught and expelled for marijuana. And it was the number one thing kids were expelled for was marijuana. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but there were 495,000 kids in school <laughs> in Colorado. So 0.04% of them got expelled for weed. I'm not saying that's good. The kids smoke weed. 
I'm just saying, are we making a mountain out of a mold? As far as adults go, though, marijuana use rates are still at 8%. That hasn't changed, so no additional cost there. And the people say they like it. In 2012, it got 55% of the vote. In the most recent Quinnipiac poll, it got 54% of the vote. And 52% has said legalization, quote, has been good for Colorado. So even the people like it. Here's another way that we save money. This is a graph of the police marijuana caseload by month, leading up to the election and after the election that legalized marijuana. Light green are cases two ounces and below. Dark green are everything two ounces and above. And cultivation, right? So they had eight, 900 cases a month, a little 700 here, a little dip in the summertime. The month right before the election, bam, 929. And then after the election, they're down to averaging about 100 arrests a month. Not just less than an ounce that they legalized. Not just six plants that they legalized. All marijuana arrests are down to 100 a month. Why? Because now that it's legal, the smell of weed isn't probable cause. The sight of a bud is not probable cause. The sight of seeds and stems in your garbage is no longer probable cause. And when they don't have that initial probable cause, the cops can't go after the two pounds you've got in your trunk or the 18 plants you've got in your garage. That's why legalization of even an ounce makes such a difference. And the estimates are we're saving 12 to $40 million a year in Colorado, thanks to that reduction in caseload. So now maybe cops could work on, oh, I don't know, the homicides. This is how many homicides are solved in America. 62%. Rapes, well, we solve about 40% of the rapes. Oh, here, the burglary. We solve about 12% of the burglaries. It's not like the cops don't have anything else to do. Instead of 658,000 marijuana possession arrests that cost two hours of police time per arrest, they can spend that time on these guys. Did you know that we have a crisis of over 100,000 rape DNA kits sitting untested in evidence lockers across this country? 100,000 potential rapes we can solve through the use of DNA technology, but those rape kits don't get tested, and here's the reason why. To test that kit, you need a criminal case. To need a criminal case, you need a suspect. If you don't have the suspect rapist, you can't do the test. But in the case of a bag of marijuana, you've got your suspect. Crime labs are overbooked, having to hire extra people to test every little baggie of weed they find to prove in court that it's actually weed, because you have to prove it. We got plenty of time to test baggies of weed, but not 100,000 rape kits in this country? There's something seriously wrong there. And did you know that we have over 100 SWAT raids a day in this country, militarized SWAT raids, where 62% of the SWAT raids are used for drug warrant searches? They use these militarized cops with body armor. Did you hear the story about the flashbang grenade going into the kid's crib and blowing a hole in his chest? Two-year-old boy may never fully recover from this. Happens every day in America. 62% of the raids are for drug searches. 65% of the time in a drug search, they'll break your door down. You have a two and three chance they're coming for drugs, they're breaking your door down. But 35% of the time they find guns when they thought there was guns there, and 35% of the time they find drugs when they thought there'd be drugs there. The whole reason they go in with the big armor and the, and the guns and the body armor and everything is, oh, they're dangerous drug criminals with weapons. But they're only finding drugs and weapons a third of the time. Oh, I'm sorry, a third of the time in general, these statistics skew a whole lot worse if you're black or Latino. A whole lot worse, two and a half to three times worse. Final talking point that they've got, and I want to leave you with this so that you can help debunk this, because this is a big one, because when you start talking about kids, people's kids, logic shuts down, mommy and daddy instincts kick in, and people will do anything to save their kids. For years, when we've looked at the polls for marijuana legalization, it rises from ages 18 to 29, it dips when people have kids, and it rises again in their 50s when the kids leave. So this is important. The what about the children thing? This is the big talking point you'll hear all the time from Kevin or one of his acolytes. You know that one out of every six kids that try marijuana will become addicted to it, okay? That's not six out of six, but that's probably something and plenty to worry about. One out of six kids will become addicted to marijuana. Oh, frightening. 
So let's take a look behind these numbers. When they say one out of six kids becomes addicted, you know what they're really saying? One out of six kids goes on to smoke pot as an adult. What they call addicted, I'll break it down for you. In the government surveys, they find that 4.4 million teenagers try pot in a year. So 4.4 million try pot. If we look at all people who ever tried pot, and then we narrow that down to just the people who tried it before they were age 18. By the way, I didn't. I tried pot when I was 22. Anybody try it before age 18? Yeah, okay, okay. Lots of people do. The average age is 16.1. But of all the people, of the 108 million people who tried pot, 60 million of them tried it before they were age 18. So if those 60 million tried it before age 18, and one out of six of you become addicted, that must mean we have 10 million addicts, right? I mean, is my math right on that? 60 million, one out of six would be 10 million, right? To get 10 million addicts, you have to count every adult who smokes four times or more per month. If you smoke a joint on the weekend, the government thinks you're an addict. That's what that breaks down to. So when Kevin Smith, these guys say, oh, one out of six kids will become addicted. He's saying one out of six kids may grow up to be an adult who smokes pot once a week. Ooh, I'm frightened. But here's why I'm really frightened, because right now is when the kids can get the weed, right? Those of you who raised your hand that smoked it before age 18, nobody carded you, right? Nobody ever asked for no ID, right? Probably the person you're getting from was your age as well. Why? Because there's profit being a weed dealer. There's money there. 44% of kids in school right now know someone at school who sells drugs. What's on the menu? 91% of the time, marijuana's on the menu. 6% of the time, cigarettes. 1% of the time, alcohol. Now, it's not like kids don't smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol, but kids don't deal cigarettes and deal alcohol. Why? Because there's no profit being a tequila dealer. There's no kids showing up with a carton of smokes and dealing cigarettes out there. There's no profit in it. We want to take that market away by legalizing and putting it in these adults-run stores, which, by the way, they just did a sting. Just this last weekend in Colorado, they sent underage kids in to try to buy weed at the Colorado pot stores. 20 different underage narc kids that they sent in, watched by police. Not one pot store, not one clerk would sell a kid weed. A couple, three months ago or so, they did a similar sting for alcohol in Colorado. They found 28, 28 different alcohol outlets that would sell alcohol to kids. So I'm not too scared about the one about the children. And our final bit of data. These, this is a trend. We've been looking at this for decades now. From 1975 all the way to 2012, these three lines represent high school seniors. When you ask a high school senior, have you ever tried alcohol? That's our yellow line. Have you ever tried tobacco? That's our black line. Have you ever tried marijuana? It's our green line, to be stereotypical. Now, when I was in high school, 1985 is when I graduated, 92% of my high school class had tried alcohol. Nine out of 10 of us. It was worse, it was 93 few years earlier. 68.8% of my high school class tried tobacco. It was worse. It was 75%. Three out of four high school seniors tried smoking cigarettes. And when I was a high school senior, 54% had tried marijuana. It was higher. It was 60% back in 78. Now, I wasn't one of them, like I said. For the class of 2012, they're down to 69% who've tried alcohol. They went from 9 out of 10 to 7 out of 10. They're down from 68%, 7 out of 10, down to below 40, 4 out of 10. How in the world did we get to two fewer high school seniors and three fewer high school seniors to try those substances without locking up a single adult? We didn't break down anyone's doors. All we did is some educational campaigns and some other things. And let me show you what worked. Back in this year, this is the year Ronald Reagan was the president, he blackmailed the states into accepting a 21 and older drinking age nationwide. Wow. 
regulating it from 21 years and older made youth use go down, it looks like. This is the year we had that lawsuit against Big Tobacco when we killed Joe Camel. Remember that? You know a kid that's 16 years old today has never seen Joe Camel? He's never seen a Joe Camel ad, right? And they still use that to try to scare us, right? But this is where we had the big tobacco lawsuit. We said, you got to take the smokes, you got to put them behind the counter, and you got to check IVs, and you got to lock them up, and you got to take away cigarette vending machines, and we got to put out these truth ads that tell kids that their lungs are going to explode if they smoke cigarettes, yada, yada, yada. And what happened? It went down. So why won't that work with marijuana? Why can't we use those same tools to combat youth marijuana use? Because I'll tell you what doesn't work, arrests. This is when Ronald Reagan started the whole Just Say No era. But you know what happened? Marijuana arrests actually went down. I have a graph I can show you where we went from 400,000 a year to 380,000 a year at the end of the second or the first Bush administration, Bush senior. Marijuana arrests went down. Now, cocaine arrests went way up. <laughs> they did a lot of cocaine arrests in the 80s, but mostly when we held off on arresting marijuana users, kind of plummeted. And then at the bottom there, well, that's when Bill Clinton showed up. Bill Clinton showed up and doubled the number of marijuana arrests during his two terms. We went from 350,000 to 700,000 during Bill Clinton's terms. And as we arrested more people, it looks like use went up among the kids. Ooh, it's an evil thing. But then medical marijuana starts in California in 1996, and from that point on, it's never raised above, never risen above that level anymore. It's always been below. That's gone up a bit, but not much, statistically speaking. So when they say, what about the children? I say, yeah, what about the children? Let's card the children. Let's keep them out of the pot shops. Let's teach them the real truth about cannabis so that when they maybe someday smoke a joint, they don't think, oh, they lied to me about pot. They must have lied to me about meth, too. They must have lied to me about cocaine, too, and think that all drugs are just bad. We need to give them factual information, some statistics, some science, and I know the kids will do the right thing. I'm Russ Belwell from 420 Radio. Thank you for sitting in a warm room. I know it's hot here. This PowerPoint presentation is available online if you're wonky, nerdy like me and you want to download this stuff. HTSF Cup. That's your coupon code, and you get it for free, the first 20 downloads can get the PowerPoint for free. Otherwise, it's, well, it's 420. <laughs> I, I gotta pay some gas money. $4.20 ain't much, folks. Thank you for supporting. My booth is in the indoor area if you wanna stop by. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? I didn't even think that we could do questions. <laughs> no questions. All right, I'll be here if you wanna talk later. See ya. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You guys know what the CBD only thing is that's happening? Okay, so some of these states, like especially in the South, they're passing it where, okay, you can have CBD. And it goes through the legislature like quick because CBD doesn't get you hot. So all these Southern politicians can go, oh, yeah, I did something about medical marijuana. I voted for that. There's CBD. Right? And then they get out of the, you know, get the parents off their back and stuff. Uh, it is a step forward because, well, at least you have them on the record saying there's something medical in there. Um, it, from a national perspective, it's tough because I worry that it shuts down the further conversation for the folks that need THC. And, and even the CBD people that need some THC in there, you know. Like, North Carolina just is legalizing one where it says that your oil has to be 10% CBD and 0.3% THC. Yeah, find it. Yeah, find me some with a 34 to 1 ratio. You're not... Did they pass it in North Carolina finally? Yeah. Just, can't find that stuff. So yeah, it's a mixed bag. It's it's a mixed bag. Yeah. The, the one the, the one that they did pass in Georgia also. Yeah. It's, it's similar to the North Carolina. Yeah. They're gonna have the universities. Yeah, and and the other thing they do with these CBD things is they pass it, but then they don't give these parents a place to get it. Right. Like the one that passed in Utah says, all right, well if you go to Colorado and get some, and you bring it back, we won't bust you. Well, it's like okay. I gotta move to Colorado. I gotta stay there for three months to get residency because you can't get a medical marijuana card without residency. 
you have to get a medical marijuana card because you can't get this stuff in recreational shops. It's a medical thing, it's CBD. So you gotta, three months, get your medical marijuana card. That's, that's for a kid, so that requires extra hoops to jump through. In the, even in Colorado, a lot of hoops to jump through to get that CBD. And then go to the dispensary and buy it. Take it out of Colorado, which violates Colorado state law. That's against the law, you can't take it out of Colorado. And violates federal trafficking laws. Well look, if these parents wanted to be criminals, they'd do that now. They just don't get it now when it's taken across state lines and violate federal law. So I'm sorry, makes me mad. I got this lady who wants a question back here. Go ahead. Okay, so on the crime and all the that they put in prison with long-term behind marijuana, is this passed? Is it passed? Is it going to let them out? Will we get people let out as we legalize marijuana? It's a great question. Uh, most of the legislative intent actions that are going right now, Alaska and Oregon, don't address that. When you look at the polling, adding on let the pot prisoners out kills it. But Eric Holder and the U.S. Sentencing Commission have just been working recently and recommended, first of all, they've been working to say that these drug crimes, the, that the sentencing guidelines should be lowered. They shouldn't get as long a sentence, you know, baby step. Shouldn't get as long a sentence. But now, just this last week, they said this should apply retroactively to people who are already in prison. So there is hope now under uh, Obama and Holder, if they can get this past Congress, uh, that, that some people who are sitting in prison now have to be nonviolent offense, no gun involved, which is BS because most of the gun charges are like somebody's you know, hunting rifle or personal protection. They're not like these oozy toting gangsters or nothing, but, right? But that's, that's, that's the rule. No gun, no uh, violence, and you'll be uh, uh, eligible for this retroactive sentencing relief. That's the best shot we've got so far. Yes, sir. What are your thoughts on California uh, updating legislation to look like Colorado you know, or Washington? You know, I'm a proponent of letting the states be the laboratories of democracy, like Justice Brandeis said, and seeing them all do something different. That's what I want to see. Don't copy each other. Let's see a, a different aspect. I was talking to John Gettman about this. He mentioned how uh, Governments want to take the black market and turn it into this government-controlled monopoly so they can have all this control and, and so that corporations don't take over. And we want it to be free market so corporations don't take over, right? That's where we have our basic uh, disagreement. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to see California, how it goes, it's the biggest state. When it goes, it goes. The whole country goes. There's aspects of Colorado's I like. Uh, building on the medical system and not you know, trying not to harm it is paramount, I think. Uh, people have already been in medical for long enough. It's a medicine. There's, uh, you know, people that risk their lives and their property to do all of this. So we have to engage legalization in a way that takes medical into account. Um, but how you do that in California where things have been so, you know, hodgepodge, there's been no state level thing, you know? I mean, Lake County's gonna ban it, but this county's not gonna ban it. And this is gonna say you can't have some of this, you're not gonna have some. I mean, Trying to make some work statewide when, and protect medical, you know, the thing that Washington's run into because it's got a similar kind of loosey-goosey medical system going on up there and they're having trouble having the, the legalization adapt to that. So the thing that Colorado did well is it already had regulated medical to build on. How California does it, I don't know. I don't know how, it's such a big state and there's so many different angles to this from the growers to the Orange County conservatives to, you know, so much to deal with that. Beyond me, we'll have to ask some of the California people. Yes? How legally do you think this is going to get around the banking issue? How's the law going to help or change? The banking issue, yeah. Well, if you don't know, there's a the banking code financial crime enforcement network called FinCEN that deals with money laundering. And they're afraid that all these marijuana businesses, Colorado, Washington, even California, that you have your dispensaries, are going to be engaging in these uh, money laundering uh, tricks uh, through their dispensary operations. So it's illegal for banks to, you know, give them credit, checking, loans. It's been a real hassle for these guys because now they have to deal all cash. And you know, they they have little storerooms and, and and I've seen them like uh, uh, Coleman coolers. Open up the cooler that stacked with cash. I felt so gangster. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> too much for me, man. But yeah, they're having to haul in cooler loads of cash to places. That's no way to run any, if you're concerned about money laundering, let these guys bank, man. You want money laundering, cash is where it's gonna happen. So uh, how can this help? What's happening right now is the FDA is, for like the third time, 
reconsidering marijuana scheduling, this might be the kind of trick that gets us into the banking and around all this stuff because it all has to do with controlled substances. If you're in Schedule 1, that's where all this banking stuff kicks in. If you can get it, marijuana down to Schedule 2 or 3, maybe these banks aren't so nervous about dealing. Credit unions are another thing. Washington's got a credit union, Salal Credit Union, that's now taking marijuana business customers. I think these littler banks and credit unions are going to be the place that are going to, you know, hey, look, there's money there. <laughs> and they're going to help this thing grow before the feds do. That's all the time I've got. Thank you so much for sticking around and asking some questions. Uh, again, PowerPoint's available if you want it. I'll be in the other building. See you later. Russ Delville, everybody. Thanks for a lot, Russ. Uh, this guy's always got the information. And if you ever follow this guy, this guy will take out anybody who uh, spots bullshit. That way. And, and it's great if you look at the threads because it goes back and forth. It's very, very entertaining, very, very educational. So we're glad to have you, Russ. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. All right. So we're going to get.